Intelligence Earth and Beyond with National Geographic Photographer David Leachmaker. Hello and welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. This week we're going to talk about the nature of intelligence as we welcome National Geographic Photographer David Lichwager to this show talking about his new book, Octopus, Seahorse, Jellyfish. Now, humans like to think we are an intelligent species and perhaps that may hold a kernel of truth. I mean, we did befriend cats, so... Speaking of which, because, you know, <laughs> why not? Intelligence is not in any way limited to our own species. In order to understand intelligence, we must recognize that trait among other species of animal. And we must also discuss what it means for a species to be intelligent. Typically, one might define intelligence as the ability to think, learn, solve problems, and adapt to new situations. The 17th century French philosopher René Descartes reasoned that since that he must exist since he was asking the question of his own existence. Hence, I think, therefore I am. His intelligence allowed him, in his own mind, to prove his own existence. How made up, right? Anyway. Trying to measure individual intelligence is difficult enough, much less the species as a whole. This problem becomes even more difficult when we try to quantify intelligence in other species. Now, researchers often measure how animals react to experiences far beyond their normal programming, such as seeing themselves in mirrors or responding to commands from humans. Silly humans. These tests may not be a fair measure of intelligence for species whose brains are wired far differently than our own. Now, crows and some other animals use simple tools or talent once thought to be exclusively human. Language, another distinction of intelligence once thought to be purely in our purview, is now recognized in the behavior of bees, dolphins, apes, and yes, even those cute little prairie dogs. Remarkably, a recent study out of the UK found that even colonies of mushrooms might have their own language of up to 50 words carried by spikes of electricity. And other creatures, including beluga whales, have even been known to mimic the sound of human beings. Look at me, I'm a human. Speaking of which, the mimic octopus has learned to, well, mimic the look and behavior of several other species of aquatic sea life. Now, the marine world is filled with a wide variety of life forms, each possessing its own form of intelligence. Perhaps no creature has such a strange mind as the octopus. The Netflix documentary My Octopus Teacher from 2020 struck a chord with millions of viewers. This narrative of a relationship between a human diver and an octopus showed firsthand the tentacle. How these creatures use their intelligence to navigate their aquatic world. The team that created My Octopus Teacher have also recently put out a magnificent new book, Underwater Wild. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. A pioneer and leader in nature photography, National Geographic also recently produced a stunning coffee table book filled with remarkable photography of three of the most curious creatures in the ocean. 
We talk with photographer David Leachwagger about his new book, Octopus Seahorse Jellyfish. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we're delighted to be joined by David Lichwager. He is a, he is a photographer well known for his nature photography and his new book, Octopus Seahorse Jellyfish, just came out from National Geographic. Welcome to the show, David. Thank you. Nice to be with you. Thanks. So, you know, you spent 12 years photographing um, these marine animals in dozens of locations around the world. What, what drove you to study life, particularly uh, underwater life? I like uh, seeing new things, learning about other ways of being. Um, trying to, you know, see what's possible. Um, I like the puzzle of, of photography and, you know, photographing jellyfish is a really interesting chore. It's, you know, it's not so simple. Um, trying to figure out how to get, you know, creatures that their principal way of hiding from predators is to be uh, transparent. Um, or in the case of uh, octopus showing, you know, the, the, they can't, they don't only just change color, they can change the texture of their skin. Um, they also have, um, because they sort of are this, unprotected piece of tasty flesh for every other creature around that's bigger than they are, they have to be really good at getting away and hiding, um, which means that they, it's to their advantage to not have a skull and a big brain, but they actually have to be smart at the same time. So how does that, how does that work? You know, and the, how do you run eight tentacles um, and their solution to do is to do it with a distributed network rather than, you know, central command and control. Um, and I, that's, and these are all things that I've learned from scientists that I, that I sort of eavesdrop on in, in the process of getting access to these creatures. So that's a rambling way of saying, you know, why I do what I do. <laughs> That's great. So you mentioned, you know, the how these animals think, particularly the, uh, particularly the octopus, which seems fascinating. Can you talk, can you talk a little bit about the networked um, intelligence systems that they have? They, you know, an octopus, as they move over the seascape, you know, or whatever, um, they, they, they can taste uh, with their suckers. They can, there's light sensitive tissue on the bottom of their tentacles that tells the top of that tentacle what color to be. Um, and so they, they, it's not, what I've been told is that they're not, you know, a signal for a certain response is not sent from, you know, the tentacle to the brain and then, the, then interpreted by the brain and sent back to the tentacle. It's like they're built to be able to do things without a some sort of without a central control. Their 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 entire way of being is is a distributed network. That's fascinating. So how? Now, how do uh, these animals use their intelligence to navigate their world? I, I'm not sure that it's intelligence in the same way that we think about it. Mm -hmm. um, and that maybe makes it even more extraordinary. Um, 
they have have a different way of being. Like, um, there's a jellyfish. It's only about half inch across. Um, and I didn't even really see this while I was taking its picture. It was only later with magnification and, and, and high resolution digital cameras and high speed electronic flashes that you ever even get to see this. But it has, um, this is a jellyfish that has eyes. And those eyes, they don't form an image the same way that we do, but it's got eight of them. And there's photosensitive uh, tissue on them, but there's also this little crystal-like um, weight. So it's an eye that can see, you know, whether the, whether the sun's up, but it also knows which way's up and down because of weight. So it's it 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 can sense light and gravity. Um, so that's, I mean, that's pretty interesting organ on a little creature that's only this big, and it's got eight of them. So that's a certain kind of intelligence. You know, is the light out? Is the sun up? Which way is up and down? And this is a creature that has no brain. Um, it's just sort of made to be smart about how it lives its life. Well, and of course, you know, that's that's about as alien as life gets on this planet. So as as we go out, uh, as we go out and explore uh, the solar system and uh, other planets, um, what can we learn from marine animals here that could help us recognize signs of life, weird life or intelligence? Uh, elsewhere. You know, <clears throat> I heard a talk by some um, astrobiologists once, um, many years ago, and it was fascinating because they were, they were trying to figure out how to make a machine that could sense life, which means they sort of had to define what that was. Because to make an instrument that could sense something, you sort of need to build it so that it can give you a yes or no answer to one or another series of parameters. Um, so I, you know, not being an astrobiologist, um, I, I can't really answer your question, but I know that it's a fascinating one and there's a lot of really smart people that are working on that one. You know, as one of the things, of course, that, you know, is going on right now is, um, is climate change and which is affecting our oceans here on earth as well as the life within it what what can the ordinary person do to help to help um help marine animals i mean my goal with this is sort of to share and maybe to intrigue and maybe to generate some affection, some interest, um, some curiosity, um, so that each person can sort of figure out what they're drawn to and what they're, how they want to, you know, how they want to use their life. Um, and so I just, I mean, I, I invite people to, participate in the beauty of the natural world in whatever capacity they have to do that. Um, and it's, you know, to succeed, uh, you know, we'll, we'll only succeed as a community. Um, and to make that community, to extend that community uh, as widely as possible, I think is... Uh, only improves one's life, so. That's beautiful. Well, thanks so much, David. It was great having you on the show. Thank you very much. Have a great day. You too. And that was David Litschwager, photographer, whose new book, Octopus Seahorse Jellyfish from National Geographic, just hit the shelves. Check it out.
And the human race is very likely to discover life on other worlds in the coming years or decades. Very likely, this will be found in the chemical markers of biology seen in the atmospheres of distant worlds. Perhaps by the James Webb Space Telescope. But the ocean worlds of our own solar system also beckon to us across the expanse of space. Europa, one of the four large moons of Jupiter, is home to vast oceans of water. And Saturn's sixth largest moon, Enceladus, may also house vast oceans of water. Uh, each of these worlds might possibly be home to alien life far different than anything we have ever seen on Earth. If there is life on one or more of these worlds, we're unlikely to spot obvious signs of intelligence from these extraterrestrial beings. Silly humans. Finding life of any sort on other worlds will be a monumental moment for the human race. Finding even simple one-celled organisms in the alien oceans of the water worlds of our solar system would change our views of the cosmos forever. But the most unequivocal sign of life outside of the Earth would be the detection of a message from a distant world. If such a message were intended as a message in a bottle to distant planets, it might possibly be seen as a simple mathematical series, the first ten digits of pi, say, or a string of prime numbers. However, the universe is bathed in radio waves from a wide range of natural sources. And if extraterrestrials are like us, most of the signals they produce, similar, let's say, to radio or television transmissions here, are not meant to be seen nor heard by beings on other worlds. That's us, for those of you keeping track. Recognizing signs of intelligence in the vast communications wasteland of an alien species would be extremely challenging. It's hard enough to find intelligence in the television shows put out by human civilizations. Such evidence is likely to be found within the wash of electromagnetic radiation, though, which constantly engulfs us. The more we learn about intelligence, the more we see it in other beings. By learning about the creatures around us and how they think, we might learn more about any intelligence which might be found beyond the Earth in the depths of the cosmos. Maybe we'll learn a little more about ourselves. Silly humans. Join us next week as we celebrate Earth Day. We're going to be joined by Dr. Catherine Calvin, Chief Scientist and Senior Climate Advisor for NASA. And just added a sneak preview of our upcoming interview with, with Time Magazine's first hero of the planet, oceanographer Sylvia Earle. An extra special treat for Earth Day. Now, try not to eat too much chocolate. Ah, uh, who am I kidding? Eat all you want. It keeps me in business. Do you have any idea how many kids I have? See you on the 19th of April for Earth, our fragile planet. How cool, huh? Please subscribe, follow, and share this program everywhere. Thanks for your support. Clear skies.